Chapter 5 Why don't other people feel angry at the things that bug me? If we can really plot things out, just as neatly and tidily as described in the previous chapter, then you would think that what triggers one person's anger would trigger the same response in another person. And to a large extent this is true. Most people, for example, don't like other people shouting and swearing at them. It makes them angry. It is a trigger for that anger. Most people don't like other folks stealing from them. That too is a trigger for that anger. Most people don't like sitting in interminable traffic jams. That too makes most people angry to a greater or lesser degree. But it is also true that people respond quite differently to some triggers. For instance, one person may get angry at the sight of teenagers playing football outside his house, whereas another may view it as part of community life. Seeing things differently. And that is the point. It is all to do with how we view the event in question. If we take a hostile view of it, then it will indeed become a trigger for our anger. If we view it tolerantly and benignly, it won't. This is not to say that we should view everything in a tolerant and benign way. And we shall see later. Anger can be very useful and productive. Nevertheless, for the time being, let us just look at how things normally work. How come one person kept waiting in a hospital outpatient clinic became really angry whereas another person didn't? Answer. Because the first person viewed it as inconsiderate and arrogant to schedule everybody in for a two o'clock appointment in a clinic which lasts three hours and believes that people should show proper consideration for each other. The second person says it's just one of those things and expects no better from people. Why does one man get intensely irritated by teenagers playing football outside his house while his next door neighbour doesn't? Answer. Because the first person sees it not only as lacking in consideration because of the amount of noise it creates, but also as a symbol of living in a more down market area than he would wish to. The second person sees it as part and parcel of living in a friendly, lively community. Why did one of the group of free men sitting by the bar door get up and confront the person who left it ajar, whereas the other two weren't bothered? Answer. Because that man believed that each person who left the door open was doing it as a deliberate provocation and felt that he was losing face in front of the other drinkers. The other two felt there was no offence meant, just that people coming into a bar are normally more concerned about getting a drink than closing the door. Why does one woman get angry about her husband eating in a very noisy way, while the same thing doesn't bother thousands of others at all? Answer because she sees it as a symbol of the difference between their backgrounds, a constant suggestion that they really should not be married at all. For her, it epitomises the difference between them. For others, how much noise a person makes when they eat has no significance. Why did I at one stage get particularly uptight about people coughing during my talks, whereas later on it didn't bother me? Answer because initially I thought that they might not be paying me enough attention or even be deliberately provoking me, whereas later I felt they were doing well to come to the course when they could be off sick. Why does one parent get angry when their son drops a mug on the floor and it breaks, whereas another simply says, never mind, and gets him to sweep it up? Answer, because the first person sees it as willful carelessness and a disregard of how much it costs to replace things, whereas the second realises that they can easily afford to buy another mug without noticing it. Why does one man get angry when his partner contradicts him in public, whereas another one doesn't? Because the first man views the contradiction as saying to everybody present 
that his wife doesn't respect him, whereas the second man views it as just the way she is. Why does one mother get angry when she finds her daughter taking a leisurely bath, whereas another doesn't? Answer, because the first mother said to herself that her daughter was only having a bath to avoid tidying her room, whereas the second mother was pleased to see her daughter taking good care of herself. Why does one father get angry with his son when he sees he has not completed his homework, whereas another father doesn't? Answer, because the first father says that his son is a lazy good-for-nothing so-and-so who is trying to pull the wool over his eyes, whereas the second father says that any normal 12-year-old is bound to be more interested in watching television than doing his homework. And so on. In other words, it is not so much the trigger in itself that produces the anger, it is what goes through the person's mind when prompted by the trigger. Appraisal and Judgment Returning to our model as set out in Chapter 4, we can now extend it to apply to three of the cases we have looked at, as shown in Fig 5.1 to 5.3, starting on page 33. Fig 5.1 Kept waiting in hospital Trigger Kept waiting with young child in hospital, outpatient department. It led to appraisal stroke judgment. The staff in this hospital don't give a damn about us patients. People should show more consideration. This led to anger. This led to inhibitions. I'd better keep quiet or my youngster won't get the best treatment. And anyway, you just don't get angry with doctors. This led to the response, polite behaviour, concentrating on the child's illness. Fig 5.2. Mug breaks on floor. Trigger. 13 year old son drops mug on the floor. This leads to appraisal stroke judgment. He is just too careless. Unless he is taught a lesson, he will grow up to be no good. This leads to anger. This leads to inhibitions. Insufficient to control anger. And this leads to the response that the parent loses it, rants and raves at son. And Fig 5.3, the door left open in bar. The trigger, customer comes into bar, leaves door slightly ajar, and thereby allows cold draft onto another customer. This leads to the appraisal stroke judgment. He's left the door open deliberately just to annoy me and show me up in front of all the other customers. If I don't react, everybody's going to be laughing behind my back, or worse, still to my face. This led to anger, which led to inhibitions, partially overcome, which led to the response, victim jumps to his feet, points finger at man who left the door open and verbally abuses him. This one extra box we have put into our model, headed appraisal stroke judgment, is a very important one indeed. It means that no longer are we at the mercy of events or triggers. Now we can see that it is we ourselves who can decide what to make of these events, how to appraise or judge them. It is our appraisal or judgment which will determine whether we will get angry and to what degree. What is more, we can actually check out our appraisal with that of others. For example, the man in the bar could have said to his two friends, do you think these people are deliberately leaving the door open to annoy us? Do you think everyone is laughing at us behind our backs? Whereupon, in all probability, he would have been reassured that this was not so, that the door was just not working properly, and this might have prevented him from getting angry. There is an important point here. Many people think that because they believe something is true, it necessarily is true. For instance, in this case, because I believe he left the door open to annoy me, it is true that he indeed le left the door open to annoy me. This is very far from being the case, but it is an easy trap to fall into until we get used to questioning our judgments and checking them out with other people.